So welcome to the Refreshing Views Observatory. Today we're not in the damp grey skies of England, we're out under these beautifully clear, beautifully dark Namibian skies. And what I thought I'd do is talk you through how I got my portable travel, my grab and go set up. How did I get that from the UK out here so I can explore these wonderful new skies. Now the lodge I'm staying at also has a Celestron C11, a CPC 1100. So we've got the big telescope that gives us a high power, high magnification views. And so what's wonderful about this is that I got this nice portable wide angle setup. I can also put a camera in here. I can do my live stacking so I get the best of both worlds. I can live stack a deep sky target, live stack a comet, but I also get to enjoy the visual setup so I can look at the high powered, high magnification view in the C11 and a low power wide angle field of view in the refractor. Now what I've done is I've split the gear into two parts. I've got the delicate optics, the electronics, the eyepieces, the camera, that all goes into a carry-on suitcase. And then the more robust, the mount, the pier, the rings, the tripod, they all fit into my suitcase so I can carry those. They can go in the checked hold, they can get bounced around, but then I've got my delicate optics, delicate electronics with me in my hand luggage. So the heart of my observing setup is a Megray 90. Now I bought this second hand, I don't know, five years ago, and it's a wonderful refractor. It's a wonderful telescope, Apro light views, stars go to pinpoint dots, but it's actually quite small and lightweight, so it's really portable. And the best thing is, of course, that the telescope telescope, so I can squidge it down and then that fits into the travel case. This then sits on a ZWO AM3 mount, and the beauty of that mount is that I don't need any counterweight, so I, I'm not carrying a counterweight in my luggage allowance. That can then just be a cantilever load on the side. So that then sits on a pier, and then there's a carbon fiber, a lightweight carbon fiber tripod, the InnerL RT90C, and that works really well. I can get that in my suitcase. I can't remember the exact weights are, but it's a pretty lightweight observing setup. This has been one of my absolute finds of the trip. This is a pie finder. Now my wife said I don't need any help finding pies, but what it is, it's a raspberry pie and it plate solves in real time. So you bore sight it on a star, you get a star in the eyepiece, you line the camera up with it, you tell it electronically where the center is, and it then knows what the camera's looking at and what the telescope is looking at. And the beauty of that is you can then say, go and look at, I don't know, the Tarantula Nebula or 47 Tucane, all these unfamiliar objects, these things we can't see from the UK. And it goes the up, down, left, right instructions and you can get it perfectly centered in the eyepiece. You can then connect the iPad and Sky Safari to it as well. So you've got the beauty of the planetarium display and you can see that as well. So I find this a real, this has been a really good observing accessory, particularly as I'm out here under unfamiliar skies. I've got my observing list and I can put them straight into the center of the eyepiece without any effort. And then just to line things up as well, I've got one of these Barda red dot finders as well. So when I'm doing my ball sighting, I can put the red dot finder on a star, get it in the eyepiece, and then do my alignment on the, on the, on the pie finder. And then at that point, I turn the red dot finder on and I'm just relying on this. I must find a way to say mount it up here, just because that is quite close to the eyepieces. And although you can dim the red light down, I think it would be better if it was up here. And this just fits in on the finder shoe. So that just mounts alongside the red dot finder on the finder shoe. Um, really nice bit of kit. My only consideration, I fed this back to Richard, the designer of this at BB Astro Design, BB Labs, is that the on off switch is really small and really hard to, hard to use. I've worked out how to do it. I can get my finger in there, but it's not a, it's not a big clunky switch. And if you're wearing gloves, if it's cold, that's gonna be a bit of a faff to use, but I could live with that for such an obs useful observing device. Just put that back in. And at the IPC end, we have a linear bino viewer. So the eyepieces are now up here. They would normally be down here. And the good thing is that the bino viewer, the linear bino viewer, takes into account the, it's got a corrector in there to bring the focal point up to here. So if your eyepieces come to focus in the telescope, then with the linear bino viewer, they still come to focus. And if I put the 30 millimeter Naglers, my second hand 30 millimeter Naglers, I get a two degree field of view at 47 power. So that's a really nice wide angle field of view. I've got the 90 millimeter panoptics in there now 
or I can switch to the 13 millimeter Naglas. I get that nice wide angle field of view. So really nice setup, really nice wide angle observing. So this is the key enabler for my travel setup. This is a, a airline portable travel case. Now I originally bought a Vanguard 55 and I use that, that's a photographer's case. So it's airline portable, you can bring it in your carry on. Now, because the Vanguard actually sort of tapers up towards the top, you do lose a lot of sort of volume just because it gives that sort of more sleeker, more aerodynamic look. So what I've done, I had this for holidays and for work travel, and I've literally taken the Velcro dividers out and I've put that in this ordinary suitcase. And again, this is airline portable, so it meets the carry-on requirements. And that's wonderful because I can get the refractor in here and I can have all my accessories, the camera, the lenses, the eyepieces, the binary viewer, that can all go in here as well. And that means I can therefore carry my delicate optics in my hand luggage. I've got everything I need and the more robust the mount, the pier, the tripod, the power supply, that can then go in a suitcase in the hole. That, they all go wrapped up in their cases. So what I'll do then, I'll talk you through what I've got from left to right then. So this is one of my favorite eyepieces. This is one of those big 100 degree, uh, 20 millimeter, 100 degree. Now this is an APM variant. You can buy a Tel Aviv variant of this and that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. This is a much more affordable variant and it delivers wonderful field of view. Uh, you know, it's a relatively low power, 20 millimeters, but of course with that 100 degree field of view, you've got this stunning field of view when you're exploring the Magellanic clouds. I've got my wide angle lens I use for the DSLRs. That's what I use for my sort of nightscape photography for sometimes use that for YouTube as well. So that's my wide angle, huge, huge, huge camera lens. So low power, wide angle field of view for photography. That is a Samyang, Samyang 14 millimeter F 2.8. So loads of light being gathered, wonderful field of view. This is my lunar and planetary uh, imaging camera. That is a Saturn C, a player one Saturn C. So that's the 533 chip, so a square chip. And then that's threaded onto a times two power mate, a second hand times two power mate, and an atmospheric dispersion corrector. That corrects for the color when objects are low down on the horizon. It corrects for the red blue fringing. So that's my lunar and planetary setup. And then what I do have, but I can't see where I've put it, I can unthread the camera, just put a two inch nose piece on. And then that's what I use in the refractor. That's what I then use for deep sky live stacking. So I can use the camera for deep sky live stacking, put it on the Barlow, sorry, put it on the PowerMate, put it on the ADC. And then I've got my high resolution, high speed camera for lunar and planetary imaging as well. This is one of my bargain buys. This is a Schwaboni, I don't know how you pronounce it, Schwaboni three to eight millimeter zoom. And this is what I use for high resolution uh, observing. So that's for splitting a close double star, zooming into Neptune and being able to see you know, Neptune's moon Triton or having high resolution views of the lunar surface. And it really is quite an affordable and quite a nice eyepiece. It's a fraction of the price of the Teleview equivalent. So I really like that, that's, that's the Javaboni Zune. Mine seems to have lost its click lock. It's supposed to be a click into position, uh, but mine seems to be infinitely variable now, which is actually not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so maybe I'll have to get another one and be able to bind a view of that would be quite cool, being able to bind a view a high power eyepiece. So that's my low cost high power eyepiece. I have a couple of visual filters. So I have a ultra high contrast, astronomic ultra high contrast, really nice for emission nebula, planetary nebula. And then I have an O3 filter as well. And again, that really does boost up the contrast, particularly if you're looking at things like the Veil Nebula, supernova remnants, planetary nebula. So yeah, O3 filter and an UHC filter. So I do find observing with filters to be a bit of a faff because you're always threading a filter on or off the eyepiece. Um, so, but they do make a real difference to the view, particularly if you're looking at more challenging objects, yes, things like the Veil Nebula, or you want to boost the contrast of things like the Tarantula Nebula. So they're well worth it, a filter. Bit of a faff, 
threading them on and off, but it really does boost the contrast. And this has been one of my really good fun observing accessories. It's pretty heavy, so do bear that in mind. This is a Denkmeyer high quality. It's a much better quality bino viewer than a sort of one of the cheaper Chinese ones. But I found this to be really good. And what's really nice about this is that I can vary the magnification. It's got a 0.6 focal reducer, or I can go straight through, or I can put a times two Barlow in. So with one set of eyepieces, you can change the magnification from 0.6 to 1 to times 2, all just by moving the slider back and forth. So that's been really nice. This tends to live once the guests are gone, once the guests have gone back to their rooms, and I'm up here observing by myself, this tends to live in the, in, in the, in the C11. And then just up here, I've got the cable for the, for the camera, the USB cable that connects the camera to the laptop. I have a lens blower, blow the dust off the chip. A lens pen, just in case I need to remove a fingerprint or remove a smudge. That's one of those small sort of, um, uh, a small micro screwdriver, just in case I need to adjust anything. And then a spare battery just for the red dot finder. So this all lives in here. Now I did order a pair of 24 millimeter ultra flat fields. That's the lowest power, widest field of view you can get with a one and a quarter inch eyepiece. Unfortunately, only one of them has arrived before I did this trip. So I'm still waiting for the other one to come. I paid for it, but it's taken a while to get that from First Light Optics. So they've actually sent me as a gesture of goodwill, a one of these red dots, uh, sorry. So they've actually sent me one of these red LED lights and this has been really useful because you can put it on yeah see i hope you can see that so you can adjust the thumb wheel so you can go from the really dim barely visible lights for sketching for making notes up to quite bright and then you can switch to white as well so for example if i'm lunar sketching or I need, i've dropped something i need to find it you can put a white light on it as well and what i've done is i put a lanyard on that and that means I've always got it here. And then with one of those extendable strings as well, I can then hold that, I can be sketching, making notes, looking at star charts, and I've always got it with me. The worst thing is do is you turn the light off, you put it down to one side, and then you can't find it again because you've turned the light off. So having it around your neck and then having it on the lanyard is really useful. I think I'd have preferred to have the 24 millimeter eyepiece, but this is not a bad, Bad substitute while I wait for the second one to be delivered. Oh, it's getting so warm now, I've had to move into the shade. The other thing you need to be aware of is I paid a bit extra. I went premium economy on Lufthansa from the UK to Germany and then out to Namibia. Now that means that I get my carry-on suitcase, my carry-on bag with the, with the optics in, and I'm also allowed a laptop bag. So I can put my laptop, the power supply, headphones for the flight. I've got my iPad with Sky Safari on. But on the luggage details, it does say that carry-on suitcase is limited to eight kilos. I'm probably on the limit or slightly over the limit with the telescope and all the eyepieces and the camera lenses. So do be aware there is an eight kilogram limit. So I really need to make that explicit. I've never had a problem, but that's not to say that nobody will ever have a problem. So do be aware there is an eight kilogram limit for your hand carry-on luggage. So that's how I've handled my portable observing setup. Delicate optics, the delicate electronics, they go with me in my hand luggage. The more robust mount, pier and tripod, they go in the check suitcase. And if you've got any questions or comments about this, then feel free to put them below. And if you've got your own setup, your own portable setup, then do let describe how you do that. Because I'd love to see how you get your observing kit out to a dark sky site or even overseas. My thanks as always to the patrons. Thank you for your continued support. And if you found this video useful, do check out the patrons page. And in the meantime, I wish you clear and steady skies.